Now, an author we talked with this morning argues that the prosperity and growth experienced in the years after World War II were an aberration and that we're now coming back to reality. Back here in the studio, it's Authors Week on The Washington Journal, and today we're joined by Mark Levinson, a former editor at The Economist and uh, author of the book, An Extraordinary Time, The End of the Post-War Boom and the Return of the Ordinary Economy. It's an economic history of the world since World War II. And Mark Levinson, you argue that that history can be divided into two parts. What are they? The quarter century after World War II, roughly from 1948 to 1973, was a time of very, very rapid economic growth, perhaps the fastest economic growth in, in world history. A lot of people all over the world became very prosperous very quickly, uh, and that had some political ramifications. People felt that things were good. People felt that their children were going to have a better life than they did. And then, uh, after 1973, things slowed down around the world in, in uh, quite a remarkable fashion. This was the era of slow growth, slow productivity improvement, a feeling that maybe our kids won't have it so good. And that's still with us today. Uh, I think we still have the memories of the good times of what I refer to as the golden age, the 1948 to 1973 period, but we're in an era now of much slower economic growth. This golden age, what made it so different from past booms? We had uh, in the golden age, a really remarkable productivity growth. Uh, productivity is really the key ingredient behind how economies grow. Okay? Productivity means essentially using resources, labor, capital, natural resources more efficiently. And in the post-war period, we had, for a variety of reasons, unusually fast productivity growth. Uh, this was helped by the fact that we had a lot of underutilized resources. People forget now, but in the United States, we had three million mules on farms at the end of World War II. Millions and millions of people were actually walking behind mules plowing farms. Those workers could move into industry uh, doing much more high productivity work with uh, modern equipment and produce a great deal more wealth. We had a pretty awful land transportation system after World War II. We invested heavily in what became the interstate highways. All of a sudden, a transport costs became much more reasonable. It became more practical to ship goods across the country. Workers could commute longer distances to find better jobs. That helped productivity. And around much of the world, we had low education levels at uh, the time of World War II. In the years after the war, uh, most of the wealthy economies spent very heavily on education, and, and this had great gains in terms of productivity. But you can think of this as, as low-hanging fruit. Once these things have been done, you can't do them again. Uh, we can still continue to improve education, but giving people an extra few months or an extra year of education doesn't have the same effect as taking people who've got fifth grade educations and uh, raising the education level for everyone to high school. Um, building a new exit on the interstate doesn't really have the same effect on the economy as building the interstate in the first place. So productivity growth has slowed down a great deal, really in, in all of the uh, industrial economies since World War, since uh, 1973. And yet in that golden age, as you call it, from, 70, uh, from after World War II to, to 1973, uh, it, it lasted for so long. You, you write in your book, that economic miracles do happen, but in most times and most places, economies grow slowly, bringing a gradual improvement in living standards, punctuated by sudden bursts of euphoria and by recessions that then throw unneeded workers on the street. This one went on for a quarter century. Why did it last so long? That's really the remarkable thing about it. We actually had a number of countries around the world that went for more than 25 years without a single recession. Uh, even in the c countries where there were recessions during that period, they were quite mild. Uh, we had an expanding welfare state in most countries at that time that gave families, average families, a greater sense of security. Uh, and all of these things were possible because we really had this period of sustained productivity growth that went on year after year. And 
no one was particularly paying attention to the fact that we had exhausted those options. This, this easy productivity growth kind of came to an abrupt halt. And that's really what made the time after 1973 so different from the time before. And we're talking about both those times uh, as we're talking to Mark Levinson, author of An Extraordinary Time, The End of the Post-War Boom and the Return of the Ordinary Economy, inviting our viewers to join our discussion as well uh, as we talk about this economic history of the world. Republicans can call in at 202-748-8001. Democrats, 202-748-8000. Independents, 202-748-8002. Uh, Mark Levinson, as folks are calling in, so, so what happened in 1973, what was the turning point? Well, what the turning point was, was not what people thought the turning point was. Okay, 1973 was the year of the first oil crisis. We had, uh, in October of that year, the beginning of the uh, Yom Kippur War in the Middle East. The Arab oil producers uh, launched an effort to raise the price of oil and embargoed oil shipments to the United States, to the Netherlands, to several other countries that were seen as supporters of Israel. So we had an energy crisis here and around the world. Uh, the price of oil went up a lot. And people naturally associated the oil crisis with the economic slump that followed. But it turned out that the oil crisis was really just masking the more fundamental problem, and that was that we'd stopped getting these easy productivity gains. By 1973, education levels in most countries had gotten pretty high. Universities had been expanded considerably. There were still improvements, but they were just coming much more slowly. Uh, by 1973, most of the farm workers around the world had moved into industry. These people had moved from the, the land to the cities and were doing uh, more productive work in, in the industrial sector of the economy. We'd had uh, trade liberalization very significantly during the 50s and 60s, which greatly improved productivity. We had uh, six agreements uh, through the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade during that period. And uh, exports uh, forced companies to become more efficient. And so all of these things had gone on, and we had pretty much gotten to the end of that by 1973. And so underlying the oil crisis to which everyone was paying attention was this productivity slump which people were not paying so much attention to. And that turned out really to be the cause of slower growth in the years after. As countries tried to counter this slower growth, did a free market prove better at that, better than a planned economy or more interventionist uh, government? One of the fascinating things about this story is that it, it took a few years after 1973 before people realized that this wasn't just another garden variety recession, that in fact we'd moved on to a slower growth path around the world. Excuse me. And um, of course, voters weren't happy about this. And we saw in one country after another uh, people coming forth with alternative solutions. Uh, during the, the period between 48 and, and the early 70s, most countries were run by what I would call liberal or social democratic types of governments. These were countries that believed in a market economy, but an activist state being, being, having a very important role in, in developing the economy. So we started to see two different things. Uh, as people got frustrated with the inability of this model to continue to deliver economic growth in the 1970s. One was we saw uh, in France a big turn to the left a seriously socialist government that nationalized a lot of industry, promising that this was going to accelerate economic growth. Well, that didn't work out very well in France. Uh, we saw in a lot of other countries, uh, Great Britain, the United States, Germany, even Sweden, uh, Japan, and, and several others, turns to the right where politicians came in saying, if we have freer markets, smaller government, lower taxes, more deregulation, that will bring us faster productivity growth and, and that will stimulate the economy and raise living standards. The track record on that wasn't very good either. So we've had this situation in which people were desperate for solutions. They knew the previous model of a, a big activist government 
with a, a free market base wasn't working very well. They tried different things to speed up the economy, and basically none of them proved successful. And people still looking for solutions today to some of these same problems. We're talking about that golden age, uh, today's economy, uh, and what changed when, when the difference was uh, with Mark Levinson. He's the author of the book, An Extraordinary Time. Again, Republicans, it's 202-748-8001, Democrats, 202 202- Seven four eight eight thousand independents two zero two seven four eight eight thousand and two. We'll be talking about the economic history of the world for the next forty five minutes. Jay is in North Charleston, South Carolina, a Democrat. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, how's everybody doing? Doing well. Go ahead. I uh, definitely. Well, um, it's not so much a question; it's more a comment. You know, uh, my parents uh, being in the mid to late seventies, and um, I always see science and mathematics as well as history as just pillars that we can all learn by and I bring this up is because I mean I love having parents this age because the information I receive from them is basically just another reference instead of reading it in a book or you know going on a computer these are eyewitness accounts um I really hope even though I didn't agree with the election that the president-elect will start to implement the building of infrastructure. I feel like that's really paramount. And maybe it could help or resurrect, you know, a faster growth in health. I'm- Jay, I appreciate that. And I want Mark and Levinson to pick up on that of investments in infrastructure and how they've contributed uh, to these economic booms or uh, how they've tried to stop any of the slow times. We had in the 50s and 60s investment in infrastructure in the United States and around the world that contributed very significantly to economic growth, in part because infrastructure was pretty poor and we had to build out airports, we had a lot of two-lane roads where traffic was very slow. It could take a week or more to drive across the country back then. And uh, the infrastructure investment had a very, very substantial effect on, on economic growth and improved productivity in our country and in many other countries. Uh, if we were to spend a lot of money on infrastructure today, that might well have some positive impact on productivity, but I think it would be much less than uh, in the 50s and 60s. Why? Because our basic transportation system is in much better shape, so we'll have some much smaller gains. This doesn't say that it's a bad thing to do. Uh, It just says that I think we need to be more realistic in terms of what the uh, impact would be. Rick is in Schenectady, New York. Democrat, Rick, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm an economist, and I think that your book has been long overdue. I really appreciate hearing all of this. Can I just add one thing that perhaps you want, might want to talk about a little bit more? Is that in the late 60s and early 70s, there was an enormous amount of inflation. You know, we had the Vietnam War, and then we had Johnson, you know, increasing uh, uh, fiscal uh, spending and, uh, you know, without any balance at all, and uh, the uh, inflation had taken off. And um, there really, as the recession began in 73, what, it began in November 73, right? The, uh, I'm a student of the uh, recovery, uh, recessions and recovery. But anyway, the, uh, the point is that when that happened, the Federal Reserve really didn't have tools anymore to, uh, to stop because we had runaway inflation along with a substantial decline in, in uh, gross national product. Can you comment on that a bit, please? One of the interesting things uh, as a historian is to put yourself back into the mindset of the times. And in those times, we had a very different understanding of inflation from what we have today. Uh, Today, I think most people would say inflation has to do with monetary policy, and the Federal Reserve's job is to deal with inflation. Back then, the discussion was really quite different and it very much complicated public policy. We had uh, something called cost push inflation. Okay, the idea here was that uh, businesses were raising prices and that was causing inflation. So, how did you deal with that? Well, if you were a president or a prime minister, you would tell uh, labor unions they shouldn't raise their Uh, you know, demand such higher wages. You should tell businesses that they shouldn't raise prices. You should impose a price freeze, and we tried that in the United States. Many countries did the same. Uh, All of these things were meant to kill off uh, cost push inflation. 
And then we had something called demand pull inflation, which people thought was different. And the idea was demand pull inflation was due to uh, companies borrowing too much to invest too much in their businesses. So you made credit hard to get. And that was the s solution to demand pull inflation. These were treated as different beasts. And then you had monetary inflation. And so you had all of these policies that we would think of as bizarre today. Uh, I don't think any president today would stand here and lecture a labor union saying, you need to ask for a smaller wage increase because otherwise you're going to cause inflation. But that's certainly what we had going on in the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, today, I think we have a, an understanding that uh, inflation is really um, caused uh, principally by monetary policy, and it's something that the Federal Reserve System uh, or other central banks uh, can deal with. But then again, we're not expecting the other central banks to do miraculous things that are beyond their powers, which is something we also expected back in the 60s and early 70s. Mark Lemonson has been studying and writing about these issues for years. He's a former uh, finance and economics director at The Economist uh, and author of five books, including the one uh, we're talking about today, An Extraordinary Time, and also the book The Box, How the Shipping Container Made the World Smaller and the World Economy Bigger. Taking your call, Steve is in Cockeysville, Maryland, Republican. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Dave. Um, oh, go ahead, Dave. The question, I, the question I have for you, Mark, is this. I'm not an economist. Uh, I've had some financial background, but I understand the concept of productivity. But what I'm concerned about, I'd like to see the you have another book and put something in that would say something about uh, what. How does that really affect the average individual? I know you've probably heard that in many cases from someone that doesn't have an economic background, but I'd like to dovetail that in with the other factors that we've changed in our economy in the, in the 70s. We started moving into a throwaway economy where the products we produced, we didn't try to repair anymore. We just threw them away and bought a new one. We wound up with government that became more argumentative, more, you know, Republicans and Democrats didn't work as well together, certainly in the last 15 or 20 years. And you've got other things. When you have a throwaway economy, you're obviously throwing away resources that you made. And to try to replicate those, that's going to take something out of it as an individual trying to live with a certain standard of living. Productivity can go up, but if you've got jobs that you don't have the jobs anymore and the people can't afford it on the wages they're getting paid, and with technology, computers, and robots, this all dovetails into productivity is an important part of our life. But these kind of things are where the rubber meets the road for the average consumer. And since we're, our economy is a large percentage of um, consumer buys, uh, how do we get out of this thing of focusing just on productivity and not recognizing how we're wasting our resources and we're buying adult toys rather than really necessities of life? I think Dave's raised an important point. Uh, we, the productivity growth uh, underlies the overall performance of the economy. It does not have much to do with the distribution of income. And one of the trends that we've seen, again, since the 1970s, is that the distribution of income has changed in almost every country in the world. The 50s, the 60s, were, the early 70s were quite unusual in the sense that the productivity gains were widely shared uh, through the economies. Uh, not just a few people felt that they were getting better off. Everyone felt they were getting better off. Uh, in more recent times, the productivity gains have really benefited a fewer people in the economy. Uh, you can do the math yourself and you can see the problem. Uh, if the economy is growing at, say, 5% a year, some people are going to do better than that. Some people are going to do worse than that. But everybody is going to end up feeling better off at the end of the year. Uh, if the economy is growing one and a half or two percent a year, which is really a more normal rate, it's likely that some people are going to be below zero. Some people are, are going to feel that their living standards are slipping, that their incomes are not growing. And that's really the situation that we've been in for the last few decades. So I think the, the distribution of the income that's produced is very significant, but we have to look at that against the background of a national income that's just growing much more slowly than it was uh, in the uh, 50s and 60s and, and early 70s. Uh, I do want to touch on one other point that Dave made there, which was a, a comment about uh, the U.S. government basically becoming, um, he didn't use the word, but dysfunctional, more argumentative were, was what he had to say. Uh, 
But I, I just want to point out that these underlying trends about slower productivity growth, slower economic growth, uh, and some of the distributional issues are actually worldwide problems. Okay? These are not simply um, U.S. trends. I think one of the things that happens uh, in the United States and in most other countries is people look at their navels. Okay? They say, we've got this problem and it's due to something happening here. If you look at the trend towards slower productivity growth, it happened in uh, every one of the advanced economies. And that tells you that there's something more going on here than what Congress is or isn't doing or some federal government regulation. There's really some uh, underlying economic issue uh, at stake here. One of those uh, watching, one of those viewers watching uh, and tweeting in uh, wants to to navel gaze a little bit at the United States, though, uh, asking what was the best decade for America from World War II until now, if we're talking about productivity? Uh, productivity, we had a very good growth in the 1960s and in the early 1970s. Uh, it turned out that 1973 was actually the peak year for productivity growth, for economic growth for the uh, entire world. Back to the calls. Another Dave. David is in Lake Charles, Louisiana, Republican. David, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, this is from Mark Levinson. Mr. Levinson, uh, in listening to you, I noticed you did not uh, bring up the three recessions that we had in that time period of 25 years between 48 and 73. I think President Eisenhower took over the reins of this country in uh, 1952, he did give us the freeway system, and that uh, put a lot of people to work, a lot to our economy. But uh, other than that, it wasn't uh, that much work. I was, I was a carpenter at the time. I just finished high school in 52, and I started out as a carpenter uh, in the union, and uh, the scale wasn't that great here in Louisiana. I did eventually move to California and, and found a little better employment stuff. But anyhow, the recessions that I'm talking about were during Eisenhower's reign towards the end of his term, I think, or might have been at the beginning of his term. I'm not sure. Mr. Levinson can probably tell us for sure. Yes, David, we did have recessions. Uh, uh, there were a couple uh, during Eisenhower's term. But these were um, fairly shallow recessions by the uh, standards of what came later. Uh, they certainly caused some unemployment. They were quite brief. Uh, the, uh, the economy went back to uh, pretty rapid growth thereafter. Things changed pretty dramatically after 1973. We had a pretty deep recession in 74-75, uh, and after that was over, uh, the economy didn't get back to where it had been before. It didn't get back to where it had been before in the United States or in any other major country around the world. And I think this is important. Uh, if you consider something like uh, the unemployment rate, just to, to give you an example, uh, one of our, our favorite economies, Germany, had an unemployment rate that began with zero in the early 1970s. It was below 1%. Uh, after 1973, never came close. The unemployment rate gradually went up to a 7% and, and stayed there. Uh, we saw uh, much the same in France. We saw uh, unemployment rising in the UK. Uh, we n n none of the countries uh, around the world was able to uh, regain the level of prosperity that they'd had in the, the previous period. And uh, this is, uh, un unfortunately, a, again, a, a global uh, development. So while we did have uh, a recession and we came out of it. We came out of it in the mid-70s at a much lower plateau than we'd been at uh, going into it. With 40 years of perspective, can we look back and say if this had been done differently, the golden age could have continued for uh, 5, 10, 15 more years? Uh, I have a quote in my book from uh, Alice Rivlin who was uh, the head of the Congressional Budget Office for, for a while in uh, the late 70s. And she made the comment that you can say we didn't do a good job, but you can't say what we should have done differently. And I think that's the conclusion a lot of people have reached as they've taken a look at this period in economic history. Uh, 
different countries were trying a lot of different things. Uh, people with different ideas were advancing these as solutions to the productivity problem, as ways to bring faster economic growth. And none of them achieved very much. And so I think that suggests that this is not simply an issue of a bad economic policy in one country or another. It's uh, really some more fundamental economic forces to which, frankly, we don't have any uh, solutions. And I've got to say, this is a conclusion that makes many people uncomfortable. It's a, a bipartisan discomfort. Uh, you hear, and I certainly hear from Democrats saying, well, this is not good. You know, we have a lot of people unemployed. The economy has to grow faster to put these people to work. And you hear from a lot of people who are Republicans who are going to say, well, you know, if we had uh, lower taxes and fewer regulations, that would solve all these problems and put people to work. These, there's a bipartisan agreement that somehow the economy can grow a lot faster than it has grown. And I'm uh, dubious about that. Uh, I think that there's really a limited amount that we can do to uh, juice up economic growth for very long. And you're right, perhaps, that the most important thing that vanished along with the golden age was faith in the future. For a quarter century, average people in every wealthy country and in many poor ones had felt their lives getting better by the day. As the golden age became a memory, so did the boundless optimism of an era of good times for all. We want to hear if our viewers think that Edward's waiting in Essex, Maryland, line for Democrats. Go ahead, Edward. Yes, yes, I basically have two questions one is there was a author on C-SPAN, who a Russian author, who said that the GDP growth of the Soviet Union during approximately that era was greater than the United States, and he didn't really go into details. He said, "Well, you have to buy the book to find out why." And then my other question is related to Elizabeth Warren's book, where she describes the distribution of new productivity over about approximately a 40-year period, and how the middle class was getting approximately 70%. And then, so my rationale is that even with a 1% or 2% growth, as long as, you know, as long as we're getting some of it, but Elizabeth Warren says in her book that we stopped getting any, any growth, any, any benefit from new productivity. So that, those are my two questions. Mr. Levinson. Okay, uh, first to the question about uh, economic growth in Russia. And I'm, I'm not an expert in Russia, but I think it's important to, to point out that there was a period in which the Russian economy grew very quickly. Uh, that wasn't necessarily good for most Russian citizens. Uh, Russia took a, a lot of resources and forced them into industry. It built some huge industries which had very large uh, output. Uh, was it very good at producing things that consumers actually wanted? Well, on that score, Russia was a pretty miserable failure in the, the 60s and 70s, or the earlier periods as well. Uh, but if you take a look at uh, simply the sheer output in terms of the, the numbers of uh, tons of steel or, or uh, the number of square meters of textiles, Russia built some very sizable industries. And at a certain point in time, that shows up as, as strong economic growth. That did not translate at all into benefit for Russian consumers. And I think that's an important point to make. Uh, the, the Russians were good at one aspect of this, building an industry. They were really terrible at another aspect of this, which is making things that people actually wanted to buy, which you'd have to do in a market economy, and you didn't have to do in a, a communist economy. Uh, in terms of the uh, comment from Elizabeth Warren about uh, productivity growth, I think the point, as I understand it, and, and I have not read her book, I think the point that the uh, fruits of U.S. productivity growth haven't been shared evenly, I think that's a fair point. Uh, I think that's accurate, and, and this is a question for our political system. Uh, I do want to point out, as I said earlier, that this gets much tougher when productivity growth is slow and, and economic growth is slow. When economic growth is fast, there's plenty for me and there's plenty for you and we can all share. When economic growth is slow, if I'm going to get mine, maybe there's not so much there for you. And that's really more the situation we've been in in the last few years. Let's head to Sun City, California. Rudy is a Democrat. Rudy, thanks for getting up with us on The Washington Journal. 
Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Mr. Levinson, your book sounds interesting. Uh, when the sun comes up in California, I will go buy it. Um, I would like to find out if you believe, and this is a question to you, if all the jobs are coming back uh, to uh, the United States. Uh, just plain and simple, are, are they going to come back to the United States? Thank you. Uh, Rudy, I don't think that the phrase coming back is a very helpful phrase because I don't think that describes the way that uh, economies work. Uh, we've got at this point a, a low unemployment rate in the United States. So most people here have been able to find jobs. The question is, will future jobs be developed in the United States or will they be developed in other countries? Um, I think there's some reasons to be pretty optimistic about what's going to happen to jobs in the United States. Uh, for one thing, uh, I, I think people, your, the, the viewers of this program, I'm sure, are aware that we've had a large uh, development in automation. And, and this is continuing. We're seeing a lot more uh, robots in industry. We're seeing a lot of jobs that can now be done by computers effectively. And so this has eliminated the advantage of cheap labor in many countries. Uh, it's really no longer necessary to take many uh, kinds of products abroad to, to get cheaper labor uh, and to provide many services from abroad to get cheaper labor because technology lets us do those sort of things in a relatively high wage country here in the United States. So uh, I think the U.S. has uh, some advantage in these things, assuming that we can keep our uh, education system on the leading edge and, and continue to have a skilled workforce. Uh, if you're thinking about, you're going to see somebody announce that they're closing their factory in some other country and moving that factory to the United States and opening it here, if that's what you mean by coming back, I don't think we're going to see much of that, but that's really not the way economic change usually occurs. Let's go to Sally, Wellington, Ohio, Democrat. Sally, good morning. Yes, good morning. Uh, my question is, um, uh, have you studied uh, how the CEOs have made fortunes uh, since about the 70s, 80s? Uh, I mean, way over what they used to make, and uh, that you know they're sucking the money out of the uh, of um, instead of building more things, more vital things for people where they can find jobs, they're making comfortable, very comfortable salaries for themselves. Even if they're fired, they get a, a, get a buyout plan or something. And uh, that, I think, to me, is, is uh, not what I like to see in our country. Uh, Sally, I don't want to disagree with that, but I want to point out that the trends in CEO pay have been very different in different countries around the world. Uh, CEOs have done much better in the United States than in a number of other countries. But we see the same trends in terms of slower economic growth, slower productivity growth in countries all around the world. So while the CEO pay may be an issue, and while you may think it, it may need to be more equitable, that probably does not have a huge effect on productivity growth in our economy or on the overall rate of economic growth. That would be my guess. Let's head to Florida, where Krista is waiting independent. Go ahead, Krista. Hi. Hi, go oh. ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, my question is, or my comment is this. Um, I am a child of refugees from communist country, and I also know a lot of people personally that are refugees from communist countries. And I think that is very hard to predict what is going to happen to us because of the fact that our election was hacked and, you know, we have been um, compromised as a nation. Our, our electoral process has been colonized, you know, they're compromised by communism. And that communism is also pretty high on the list of a lot of the cabinet members. You know, they work very closely with Putin and, and that sort of thing. And for us to be able to say what's going to happen, we don't know. Mark Levinson, perhaps you can talk about uh, Russia's economy today and, and the trends that they're going in. Uh, I'm really hesitant to go there. I'm certainly not an expert on Russia's economy today. Uh, I think that these underlying issues that are really not within the scope of my own work in terms of automation and in terms of uh, the end of, of uh, large-scale factory employment and, and these kinds of things. They're facing many economies around the world. 
Uh, these are, again, global trends. One of the things I know you do touch on in your book is the impact of environmental regulations uh, and the push for more environmental regulations in the 70s. Uh, Barkway on Twitter uh, says, one generation gets all the fruits of post-war industrialization and the next generation to follow gets all the environmental fallout. Can you touch on that? Uh, I think there's something to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we had, uh, in the post-war period, a very poor... Uh, environmental regulations. And uh, during the 50s and 60s, we had this very rapid industrialization that was um, that had some very negative environmental effects. There's no question about it. And those things generally don't show up in uh, the income statistics. Those aren't part of GDP, but they're real. Uh, one of the reasons we've had somewhat slower growth since the 70s is that our country and most other advanced countries have put a lot of money into uh, environmental work. We've uh, spending money on um, pollution cleanup, we're spending money on environmental control systems, uh, we're spending money on better disposal of hazardous waste, and all of those things uh, divert money from other kinds of investments that might uh, stimulate uh, GDP, which doesn't mean that they're bad investments. They're, they're very positive investments for, for the health uh, of the world. Uh, it's important to remind people that uh, we measure economic growth, but economic growth, the way we measure it, isn't everything, okay? GDP doesn't really capture how healthy we are and how happy we are, that there's some other very important so values. The, and the Bobby Kennedy speech on this. Environmentalism is, uh, is one of those values. It's, it's important to have a clean environment, even if that doesn't uh, show up in our national income accounts. Warrington, Pennsylvania is next. Carol is a Democrat. Carol, good morning. Uh, yes. You mentioned that um, around the world, uh, executives are making maybe less money, but there doesn't seem to be any appreciable difference uh, in the way their economies are going. Um, in uh, European uh, countries, uh, they have a, a much better safety net. They have um, uh, national health, sure, sure, uh, yeah, health insurance uh, throughout. And uh, what impact if uh, the U.S. Uh, on the middle class and on the economy would it have if we were to adopt some of those um, um, th those safety nets that they have uh, in the uh, European economies? That's a great question. Uh, I want to point out that the safety nets in many of the European economies have grown much weaker over time. This tends to get lost in the discussion in the United States. But, for example, if, if you're a, a young person coming into the job market today in Spain or Italy or sometimes even in, in France or Germany, you're likely to be offered a temporary job. You're not likely to be offered a career. You may be in that temporary job for a good while. You may have to change temporary jobs. And those temporary jobs tend to have fairly poor pay. They tend to have fairly poor benefits. So if you get a job in the regular economy, if I can use that word, if you become an employee of a big company in Europe, you're doing pretty well. But if you're doing a, one of these temporary jobs, a mini job as they call them in some countries, you're not doing very well. You're really struggling and you have uh, no security at all. Uh, I say that not to praise what's going on in Europe, but to point out that the Europeans are dealing with many of the same underlying economic trends that we're dealing with. How do you uh, stimulate uh, the economy at a time of slow growth? Well, you try things like uh, basically reducing wages, which is what happens when you make people go into to temporary kinds of jobs. You weaken the safety net in various ways. So we're seeing a number of European economies in which retirement ages are going up. We're seeing places in which the health benefits are becoming less generous. Uh, these are uh, similar trends to what we're having in the United States. I think uh, on balance, uh, Western Europe still has a better social safety net than the United States has. But the same uh, issues that we have in terms of uh, sustaining this social safety net are evident in Europe. About 15 minutes left with Mark Levinson talking about his book, An Extraordinary Time, The End of the Post-War Boom and the Return of the Ordinary Economy. Bob is in Kingwood, Texas, a Republican. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, 
Yeah, Mr. Levinson, uh, I just wanted to get your comment on, I, I think you had mentioned that unemployment was down. Uh, President Obama did take a, advantage of that in his last uh, press conference, but he said that um, the unemployment was down. In fact, the, the jobs are part-time jobs, are they not? And a lot of people that are working are not working very much, and their their pay is low. That's the first thing. The second thing is with uh, low interest rates, with zero interest in your in the interest rates, isn't that a false impression of what our GDP is? I mean, for the last eight years, we've had a had a low to no interest rate, and the economy can't do anything. So, what are your comments on that? Uh, we've had in this uh, country. Uh, serious growth in uh, full-time jobs. Uh, there's still plenty of people out there who say they would like a full-time job and either they're working part-time or they're out of the labor force because they, can't, they think they can't find a, a full-time job. But we've had a very good growth in full-time employment. The uh, uh, unemployment rate now for college-educated people believe, begins with a 2 uh, it's it's really quite low by historical standards. And even uh, for people with, with lesser educations, in many parts of the country you see signs of, of a labor shortage. Uh, there are parts of the country that uh, I've driven through lately where you see help wanted signs uh, all over the place. So I think we've seen some real Im improvement in the labor markets. Uh, that doesn't mean that there uh, aren't uh, further gains to be had there. And I think it would be great if more people who say they aren't in the labor market wanted to come into the labor market. I think that will probably happen because we've seen uh, wages starting to go up after a long period in, in which they didn't. Uh, in terms of the connection between zero interest rates and the GDP, uh, I'm not sure what that is. Clearly we've had uh, interest rates quite low, but again going back to my comments earlier about inflation, I think most people now understand that the, the Federal Reserve's job is mainly to fight inflation. Uh, if there's no inflation in the economy, then there's not a great reason to worry about what interest rates are. Uh, if the Fed sees signs that inflation is starting to pick up, then obviously it has to respond to that and encourage interest rates to rise. And I think we've started to see that. Uh, we may have a gradual adjustment of interest rates here uh, to, to what would be more normal levels by historical standards. Uh, if that happens in a, a fairly gradual way, I don't think it's going to hurt a lot of people. But uh, this really depends on how the Fed reads inflation. Uh, I don't think that there's really a connection between uh, zero interest rates and whether GDP growth is real or not real. I don't, uh, I don't agree with that. Let's head to South Bend, Indiana. James is waiting, independent, go ahead. Oh, yes. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. A uh, couple quick, uh, I'd like you to comment on a couple quick points. Number one, the word capitalism does not appear anywhere in the United States Constitution. However, it is very clear in the preamble it's the government's constitutional duty to promote the general welfare of the people. Now, you uh, also correlate that to the top tenth of one percent having more wealth than the bottom 300 million Americans. Uh, can, you put, can you put those three things together and speak a little bit on those, what the Pope Francis called devil's dung, capitalism? Well, I, I don't want to pretend to be a, a constitutional scholar here. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's, it's a fair reading that uh, we have a, an economy that's mixed in a lot of ways. Okay, the government has an important role. Uh, the private sector clearly has an important role. Purists would tell you that this isn't really capitalism. Some people will tell you that it's, it's too much capitalism. Uh, I think what we've seen, again, around the world is that what we've got is fairly similar to what most other economies have. There's a, a mixed economy with a, a significant role for government. Uh, the question that we and, and many other economies are facing is what should that role for government be? Uh, and a question that I discuss at some length in my book, An Extraordinary Time, is whether making government smaller actually brings faster economic growth, whether it actually leads to higher productivity growth. Uh, the evidence, just based on what we've seen in various economies around the world in the last 40 years, is that there's not necessarily a connection. 
you see some economies in which government has a larger role and they've grown faster than economies in which government has a smaller role and vice versa. So I don't think that one can make a statement about this based simply on ideology. Uh, the reality is that the world is a messy place and different economies have had uh, different rates of success, not necessarily related to this question of how big or how small a government is. Clayton, North Carolina. Anne is up. Independent. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you for taking my call. I would like to uh, uh, tell to uh, Mr. Levinson that I actually lived in Soviet Union in the 60s, and I am a professional historian. And, and I um, would like to um, tell him that um, it was a good life uh, at that time in Soviet Union. And it was actually comparable with the United States of America. I even remember, like, um, uh, in some journals and magazines and newspapers, uh, we had a comparison what we can uh, could buy for one ruble and what we could buy for one dollar, and it was exactly the same. And also, I would like to um, tell him that and that time, people were buying lots of um, things, just like in the United States, uh, TV sets and refrigerators. Everything was novelty. Um, of course, in a big refrigerator, a better TV sets. And also, in Soviet Union, uh, people had free housing, and that they have free education and free health care and food was heavily subsidized. That's Anne's view from inside the Soviet Union. Oh, thank you, Anne. I appreciate that. And, and I'm sure the uh, viewers here will uh, appreciate that uh, view of the Soviet economy. Santa Rosa, California. Lou is a Republican. Lou, go ahead. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call. I want to say uh, uh, this country started out, uh, um, you know, with a few rich white landowners, and uh, they had slaves, and the slaves weren't free. They had to uh, feed and house them, so so they weren't free. So now what do we have today? We have a few rich corporations that all they want to do is pay wages equal to or less than food and housing. Are we, uh, are, is the working class of America now slaves to the corporations? Uh, I think, uh, Lou, that what we've seen um, all around the world, and again, this is not just a United States story, is that in recent decades, uh, a larger share of what the economy creates has gone to the owners of capital rather than the owners of labor. Again, this is an issue that I discuss at some length in my book, uh, what we refer to in economics as the labor share, okay, the piece of, of the pie that, that goes to workers, uh, has gone down in most economies. And so some of this may be due to uh, factors uh, specific to the United States. For example, this uh, woman who uh, called earlier mentioned uh, CEO pay. Uh, there may be things here in the United States that contribute to this, but there also seem to be some worldwide trends that contribute to this. And one is clearly that workers have less bargaining power. Uh, this is due in part to technology. Okay? Uh, a company may offer you uh, a job here in the United States. Uh, if you want more of a wage than it's willing to pay, it may have the ability to shift that job to another country. Okay? Technology has made this possible, and it has perhaps reduced your bargaining power as an individual because it's no longer stuck with just the local labor market. The company now may have a global labor market, and if it can't get the goods and services it wants at a price here, it can go to a different city or a different country and get them equally well. Uh, I think that this is one factor that has really led to the decline in the, the labor share around the world. Uh, a question is whether uh, this starts to change. We've had some evidence in the United States in the last couple of years that maybe the, the labor share of the economy is stabilizing or even starting to rise a little bit. Uh, if that starts to happen in some other countries, I think it would be a very beneficial trend. Azriel is in Kingston, New York, Democrat. Good morning. 
Yes, good morning. Thank you for C-SPAN. Uh, I just want to ask Mr. Levinson the direct correlation of energy production and consumption and how it relates to the effects of the GDP. For example, um, if we produce more energy than we consume, we actually eliminate our financial dependent on resources. And so it's healthy for the environment and also the communities to do renewable energy. And I just want him to explain how energy drives every economic structure. And if people are allowed to produce energy, they can also improve the economic structure of our communities and our global world. All right. Mr. Levinson. Well, you know, in, in the period that I'm writing about uh, in my book, we had uh, a very lengthy discussion of energy independence. Okay, energy independence was the, the code word in the United States in the late 70s and in the 80s for we're going to produce all of our own energy. We're not going to import uh, energy anymore into the United States. And I should say that uh, a number of other countries followed similar sorts of strategies. Uh, it turned out that energy independence wasn't a terribly smart strategy. Uh, for one thing, it was often cheaper to import energy from other places than it was to produce it in the United States. Uh, another factor is that uh, many of the ways in which we tried to produce energy here were uh, fairly uh, inefficient. Okay, energy production of all sorts is quite heavily subsidized in the United States. That goes for renewables, it also goes for fossil fuels. Uh, and also goes for nuclear energy. So these were not necessarily uh, terrific investments from an economic point of view. So uh, I would not agree with the caller that uh, energy is somehow a, a special part of the economy that uh, needs a special treatment, a different treatment from, from everything else. Uh, and I don't really think that the problems that we experienced with energy in the 1973-74 um, period with the oil boycott uh, really had much to do with the slowdown in economic growth that followed. Time for just one or two more calls. Uh, Rich is in Marion, Ohio. Republican, go ahead. Yeah, uh, really good questions there. Uh, don't we pay a certain amount on our, our energy for defending Saudi Arabia and other countries? Does it get uh, put in, into those numbers? Uh, other questions, it was... Um, if we had a long recession, like for three years, a really solid square wave that hit us really hard, would a lot of people's benefits then run out, and then they would no longer be considered unemployed because they wouldn't be collecting benefits? So, in essence, we'd have zero unemployment, but everyone would be out of work. Uh, I'll hang up and listen to your answers. Thanks. Uh, to the question of whether or not we are subsidizing oil by protecting Saudi Arabia. This is really an area outside my expertise, and I don't want to pretend to, to give you an answer. Uh, with respect to your second question, uh, the answer is, is no. Uh, the unemployment rate is not related to whether or not people are receiving uh, unemployment benefits. The question that people are asked when the Department of Labor surveys uh, every month about uh, employment is uh, whether you have uh, done work in the previous week, and if not, whether you are uh, able, available, and, and ready for work. So if someone says that they've been looking for work and they're ready to take work, they're going to count as unemployed whether or not they're receiving unemployment benefits. We have about a minute left. We've been talking about that extraordinary time, that golden age that you uh, studied the history of in your book. How optimistic or pessimistic are you that we'll ever see a golden age again? You know, this is a very uh, hard thing for many people because I think this is something that's beyond our control. One of the fantasies we've had really since the, the 1950s is that the government really had the ability to control this sort of thing. And productivity growth comes mostly out of the private sector and it comes mostly in very unpredictable ways. It shows up when we don't expect it, and then it goes away. So if, if you look around the world today, you say, where is the next spurt of productivity growth coming from? Uh, you can see technologies, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, many others. Uh, right now, these don't have much effect on the economy. Could they have? Could they lead to a, a whole range of changes in business and government that increase productivity? Absolutely. 
When will that happen? I don't think anyone can tell you. Uh, and that's the conundrum. You know, we saw a period three or four years of rapid economic growth in this country in the 1990s, early 2000s, due largely to investments in computing and communications that we'd made 30 and 40 years earlier. Suddenly, it changed the way business did business, and it had a great economic benefit. That may happen again. I don't think we can know that. So I'm not pessimistic. I'm not in the no growth camp at all. Uh, but what I do say is this isn't something that a president or a prime minister can order up. We can't predict that this is going to happen next year. Uh, it's, it's really um, beyond our ability to control. And if our viewers want to read more about it, the book, An Extraordinary Time, The End of the Postwar Boom, The Return of the Ordinary Economy. Mark Levinson is the author, and we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you for having me, John.